password. And we are good to go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to TGI, uh, which currently, or always, I should say, stands for the greatest indoor reading series. It began um, in March or so of this year as an attempt to have some form of community, despite the isolation we were all going into, um, an isolation which has lasted, I think, longer than anyone would have suspected, and also um, has been, well, interesting to say the least. Anyway, how's everybody's week? It's been weird, right? Okay. <laughs> I wake up every morning and I just, it makes sense, right? Because there's so many people voting. It shouldn't, it should be, should take a while to figure it out every time, but it's, there's something about this that's a, I've been finding profoundly stressful. So I actually just don't bring that up in order to bring that into here, but I do bring it up in order to um, comment that uh, this is a place, um, an oasis from that. This is a place to focus on uh, artistic endeavors, creative things. Sometimes those may be about politics, and that's fine. I'm not telling anyone to not be anything here. Um, just, you know, uh, creative pursuits, at least for me, give me a bit of a sense of um, control or mastery or the ability to change the world in some tiny way, even if it's just in twisting my own perception a hair. So I love to come here and see how everyone else chooses to do that or has been chosen to do that, depending on how you uh, see things. So uh, tonight we have a wonderful uh, lineup of, um, we have a couple of uh, writers, we have a photographer, and then we have uh, a, well, a couple of writers um, who include actually our first ever three timer. So that is impressive and also a sign of uh, longevity on our part. Um, now the elephant in the room, uh, just very quickly, I will say, yes, I have a big silly mustache. I will talk to you about that afterwards if you'd like to. Um, for now, just enjoy how much I look like the bass player from Super Tramp or something uh, while I host this show. All right, our first reader this evening is Diane Neary. Uh, she is a writer, journalist, and documentary filmmaker from New York City. Her feature stories and essays have appeared or are forthcoming in Harper's, New York Magazine, Elle, The New York Times, The Nation, Go, In These Times, The Independent, and elsewhere. She's a doctoral candidate in creative writing at Florida State University and nonfiction editor of the Southeast Review. Diane has taught, volunteered, and advocated for incarcerated people all her adult life and is currently writing a book of lyrical vignettes about the rise of the American prison. She lives in Tallahassee, Florida, with her partner and daughter and their two cats. All right, and you should be able to unmute yourself and take us away. Hi, everyone. I did not know I was going first. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Ridge. Um, it's so nice to be here. This is my first time reading here. And so I'd like to thank um, Trina for inviting me um, and all the other readers tonight. I'm so happy to be in the company of people I respect so much as writers and not only as writers, but as people, those of you who I know, but I'm, I trust um, that the two of you who I don't are lovely and I'm so excited to hear you read. Um, what I'm reading are two really short vignettes from that book that Ridge just talked about. Um, it's a manuscript in progress, uh, tentatively entitled, As If We Were Already Free, Unmaking Myths of American Justice. Um, it's a chronological history and vignettes about the rise of the American prison. Each individual vignette is told in the present tense um, and together they span from 1492 to the present day. A trajectory that leads our current era of mass incarceration. Um, listening. Sorry. We're having a little, hold on one second, a uh, little technical thing that happens on Zoom occasionally. I'm going to uh, not allow participants to unmute themselves to prevent any further uh, issues. So you should be okay now. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so together they chronicle this trajectory of events from 1492 to the present day that has led to our current, um, this current era of mass incarceration in the United States and our role as the world's great incarcerator. Um, so I thought I would start with a series of vignettes I'm still currently working on. Um, 
And there's going to be about half a dozen of these when um, they're finished. I'm only reading two tonight. And they're about uh, Alcatraz Island and the, the prison at Alcatraz um, off San Francisco. So um, this one starts May 1847, Alcatraz Island, San Francisco, Island of the Pelicans. John Charles Fremont, governor of the newly won territory of California, has just purchased from the Mexican government a rocky island whose first surveyor decides it, quote, unfit for any building purposes and nearly impossible to mine. 15,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, melting glaciers formed this beachless mass of sandstone. One year before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, a Spanish lieutenant designated the rock La Isla de los Alcatraz for birds whose bills grow horns when they are aroused. Now the island is home to the first lighthouse on the west coast and a military prison for unruly soldiers, Confederate sympathizers, and native men who will not be civilized by their invaders. In 20 years time, it will contain more than 400 incarcerated men. John Fremont, who leads a total of five expeditions into the American West and massacres at least three unsuspecting Klamath and Winton villages, will become the first Republican to run for president of the United States and lose. His descendants will forget his claim to Alcatraz, which has proven itself a white elephant for the government. From its first occupation by army engineers to its last by Native American activists, this island, named for the brown pelicans who take flight in groups and will never know the threat of extinction, will remain under federal control. Whenever civilized nations occupy an island, wrote Blaise Pascal 200 years ago, they turn it into either a prison or a fortress. Regarding Alcatraz, the French philosopher is correct on both counts. January, 1895, Alcatraz Island. One of the world's first handheld cameras in the hands of Russian-born Mennonite missionary Henry Both, photographs the arrests of 19 Hopi in the Aravi village of Navajo County, Arizona. The men are rounded up for the arrogance of refusal. They refuse to farm using the methods of white men and refuse to be moved off the northern mesas onto, quote, individual allotments. The land carved up like limbs whose veins are severed from the body's beating heart. Worst of all, they will not surrender their children for re-education in the ways of their conquerors. Accompanied by military escorts, Navajo County police capture more than 100 young Mokis, some just five years old, and herd them like animals onto wagons bound for a boarding school 35 miles away at Keams Canyon. By their attitudes towards state-sanctioned kidnapping, the Hopi are divided into hostiles and friendlies. Those who resist are starved into submission with two feet of snow on the ground and a mumps outbreak surging through the government school, Lieutenant Plummer from nearby Fort Defiance orders its superintendent to quote, suspend all issues of annuity goods and all work on houses and wells for the Mokis of the Second Mesa. Now it is the fathers, 19 ringleaders of Hopi hostiles who are taken from their families and carted by foot, horse, train, and boat to a rock jutting out of San Francisco Bay. The cells of the military prison at Alcatraz contain Spanish prisoners of war and political radicals. Each man is consigned to quote, carry a baby, not a child, but a 24 pound ball chained to his leg. While the Hopi men are imprisoned nearly a thousand miles from the Western desert, two of their wives give birth to children who quickly die. If solitary confinement in damp wooden cells is crushing for stalwart soldiers, what will it do to these men who till a common land in one of the oldest continuously inhabited, inhabited settlements in the nation, to Moki wives forced to bury and grieve their infants alone? Condemned to the squalid, airless fire trap of Alcatraz's lower prison, they are held in confinement, quote, at hard labor until they fully realize the error of their evil ways. Until, quote, these crafty redskins, opines a morning call reporter, quote, can see the harmlessness of the multiplication table. For invoking Tauva, the Sun Father, Hopi children at Keams Canyon boarding school are given new names by white teachers who cut off their hair and burn their clothes. For praying to Kachinas or speaking their native language, they are beaten and commanded to wash in filthy tubs. 
The Hopi do not envy these men amputated from their land, their gods, and one another. Even the friendlies despise the federal government and begin to promise cooperation with no intention of compliance, a tactic of passive resistance that will infuriate white men for decades to come. So that's only the, one of the middle vignettes. Um, the, one of the final ones will be the story of the occupation of Alcatraz Island by Native American activists in, of several different tribes for 19 months in 1969. They wanted to turn it into um, a native cultural center. There were 89 men, women, and children. And um, they, um, they spray painted a message all across the water tower reading, peace and freedom, welcome, home of the free Indian land. Thank you so much for listening and have a wonderful night. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and that's really, you know, <clears throat> interesting stuff because it, it's easy, uh, it's easy to take our disproportionate incarceration and our legal, you know, legal system, criminal justice system a bit for granted in the sense that, you know, a, a lot of us have just grown up and there's, you know, we learn early on like, oh, prisons where they put bad people, but there is all this history and these little steps along the way. And, and a lot of it has to do with the myth of civilizing others through punishment. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the myth, the mythical history of America, which is, you know, our, our, our myth is America's where if you do the right things, everything is amazing all the time. And if you do the wrong things, well, it's your fault. And, you know, looking a little bit deeper at this, you know, unfortunately, I don't know, because I'm not in an academic setting in history, but from what I can tell, um, historians aren't as interested in it as maybe activists and art, art creative people are um, in sort of re-examining this idea that, um, you know, that, that this country was founded by heroic people refusing um, to pay taxes or something. And it's just gotten better and better since then. Um, and I think this is, sounds like it's, I, I love um, in the construction of what you read, it's just so factual. It's just, it's, this is what happened, this happened and then this happened. And like, I love that the quote in there, the most absurd quote is that reporter saying that they have to accept time uh, multiplication tables as though like that's really the issue it's not taking people from their family homes attempting to destroy their language and destroy their heritage it's they're mad because we tried to teach them math and i think that that delusional quality um that's the thing uh, if you trace back say we're we're on a little budding flower right now that's the thing in the roots uh of the of the plant so I think this is awesome that you're that you're taking a look at that. Um, the uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention, I don't know if you have anything available currently publication wise. Um, if you wanted to send links uh, over to Noli, she can post them in the chat. We do like to just keep track of people we've had on the show. And, and I think there wasn't anything with your bio, but if you do have anything you want to plug, feel free. Um, and I can, I don't know if you need, if you want to do it verbally, I can unmute you because now we're in a weird mute zone. Um, how do I do this? Oh man, this is the uh, this is the fun, right? This is the fun we have on Zoom here. It's a different thing every week because um, sometimes I know what I'm doing. Here we go. You should be able to unmute yourself uh, now. I don't have any anything forthcoming, unfortunately, in terms of like a book project. This is the book project I'm working on, but it's going to take okay. a while before it's. Um, finished. But thank you so much. That was all really well said. And I, I appreciate everything you said about it and that you got so much out of that little snapshot of the project. And thank you again for having me. Oh, sure. Thank you. All right. All right. So moving on, I have a feeling we're now going to someone who maybe I can see the arm of on your screen, Diane. I'm not 100% sure. I got the sense you guys might be in the same room. Oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> um, so our next reader is Robert Stewart Powers. He is a writer from Washington, DC. His work can be found in The Glimmer Train, World Literature Today, XRAY, and other journals. 
Most recently, he was a finalist for the Missouri Review's Jeffrey E. Smith Editor's Prize. He's currently studying for a PhD in fiction at FSU. He lives in Tallahassee, Florida with his partner, stepdaughter, and their cats, excellent cat names, Noodle and Poem. Uh, so let me find, there you go, Robert. You should be able to unmute and take it away. Yeah, thank you. Ooh, I think you might have to mute that. All right. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, th I think I've, I've had the pleasure of being invited as through like a friend of a friend, that, that, but that, I feel like I've happened into this like just uh, like amazing community that I didn't even know existed. So thank you for uh, having me and welcoming me. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm a fiction writer, uh, which is getting harder and harder by the, by the year I've been alive. Um, so the, what, what, what I'm gonna be reading from is from a longer work, but this, should, this is a self-contained piece that I'm gonna throw a title on it, uh, 1200 More Miles to Quine, Oklahoma. Um, this is uh, from a larger work wherein this is after a series of cataclysm, personal cataclysms has upended the life of someone who works in the art department of a Seattle children's hospital. Uh, forcing him to sort of leave Seattle to head back to his hometown where he hasn't been in a very, very long time. Um, this should speak for itself. Um, yeah, I, I guess all other, other than that, I think when it comes to writing fiction these days, it's, it's really tough to write the way, to write the world as it actually is rather than the world as you'd like it to be. Um, this is sort of my attempt to write the world as it really is. All right, so 1,200 more miles to Quine, Oklahoma. A quick 13 hours through the night from Seattle to the almost full parking lot of a dusty pancake franchise in Bluffdale, Utah, off a busy highway surrounded by strip malls. A blinding pale blue sky of nothing, nearby mountains like rows of broken teeth. I was so tired I could have been dead, dreaming. Would have been hard to say. En route, more than 10 cop cars. By Oregon, I'd lost count. Somewhere in Idaho, one finally came with lights blazing from at least a mile back. I was readying to pull over, but it zipped by. I'd done nothing wrong. I think we're safe, I said loud enough to wake Char, lying down in the back seat. When she saw what we were having for early brunch, she yayed and did her aggressive happy dance. Cakes, 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 she said, pumping her arms, bobbing in place. I didn't want to tell her we had another 17 hours to my hometown in Oklahoma, where I hadn't been for almost 15 years, where my mom was well into losing my mind and my dad had days ago died in his sleep, which I learned about via text from my mom. Still, I had to explain, you can't have your phone until we arrive. Uh, we can't, you can't have your phone until we arrive. Uh, remember, low profile. Then how are we supposed to remember the trip, she said. Again, she explained why she had to film reactions to her full body Spider-Man costume with muscle padding in the shoulders, arms and legs that she'd been wearing since we left, that she'd taken to wearing at home since her mom, my fiance for a year, left on Christmas and emailed her parents and sent me a suicide note in 100 cantos on New Year's. Char's dad, my fiance's ex since Char was barely walking, bought her the costume a month before Halloween, a few months after finishing five years for armed robbery. He brought it over to our apartment for Char to try on and made superhero poses for social media, the only time I ever met him. He overdosed a week before they could go trick-or-treating and my, and my fiance's well-off parents in New York started demanding custody. You'll ruin Char, they said. In the days before my dad died, as Char was wrapping up fifth grade, they were screaming at me on the phone to expect scorched earth legal ruination if I didn't behave when they flew in. Go ahead, they said, block our numbers, you nobody. They didn't care how I was managing. They heard how I lost my job at the children's hospital. They'd get an Amber Alert issued. I wouldn't even see them coming for me. Stop, I said, turning to look at her. Char could tell she'd won something. You look so tired, she said, like death. I told her she didn't have to change into normal clothes, but maintaining your secret identity, I said, pulling the mask over her face is non-negotiable. I don't know what that means, she said, and was out crossing the parking lot in her fuzzy unicorn slippers before I could find my sunglasses. 
a family of five on the sidewalk bearing leftovers gleefully parted to let her through. Cute kid, their mom told me. She's the cutest, I said. She, the mom said. Only then did I see the two police SUVs parked right up front. Four tall beefy officers, three male, one female, in the busy lobby being shown to a table. I'm allowed to have root beer, Shar said, opening the glass door. Mom said root beer isn't beer. Before I could get her out of there, a waitress approached with menus and fell madly in love with Shar's costume. A little early for Halloween, she said, almost shouting. The eyes at every table were on us. A boy Shar's age stood on a seat to take a video and Shar struck a low to the ground stance to light applause. How old's your son? The waitress said, leading us through the aisle. I couldn't find where the cops had gone. Is everything okay? She said. Great, I, great, I said. I'm 11, Shar said. Wow, you're a girl, the waitress said. She's your daughter? Yeah, I said. He's my mom, Shar said. I tried to laugh and failed. Well, he looks like a dad to me, the waitress said. I wouldn't find the cops until we were sitting in our booth. They were in a line sipping coffee, looking right at me from across the restaurant. He's not my real dad, Shar said, looking over the menu. Is that so, the waitress said. She's kidding, I said, taking off my sunglasses. Can I get some coffee? She looked at me like I'd done something horribly wrong. Been driving long, she said. Doesn't he look like death, Shar said, pointing at my eyes. Enough, I said. We're heading to my mom's, I said, in another state. And where's your mom, the waitress said to Shar. She died, Shar and I said in unison. Oh, the waitress said, touching her mouth. She apologized for asking, said how sorry she was. She touched my shoulder, then Char's. She's still with us in spirit, I said. Char scoffed, returning to her menu. The waitress stared right through me. She said she'd give us time to decide. I watched her make her way across the restaurant to go talk to the cops. She pointed in our direction. The cops talked, to, talked amongst themselves, and the one female cop got up and made her way toward us. She looked unhappy. I considered grabbing Char, throwing a chair through the window, running us to the car. I could speed us out of there before we were surrounded, then Shar could take me under her arm and web sling us out of there. They'd never catch us, we'd be free. Before I could stand and introduce myself, a low piercing drone began to blare from every phone in the restaurant. The female cop stopped her marching to check her own phone and her partners got up, raced towards her, phones out. Babies were crying. Shar held her ears and screamed. A fleet of sirens barreling by on the highway outside. Most of the restaurants stood to gasp as a pursued car that looked like mine crashed through the four-way intersection, through the boxy shrubbery and into a slew of other cars in the parking lot. Within minutes, Shar and I were back on the road. When she asked what had happened, I told her, God laughing. And that's all I have. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Robert. That was uh, uh, such a engaging and, and interesting story. And I think also uh, well, part of it was helped by the fact that when you were reading that like last couple paragraphs, there were really loud sirens going by our apartment here in New York. Um, but, you know, what you said about the beginning about wanting to, you know, write the world the way you want it to be versus this sort of uh, what I got from that piece was this sort of messier, um, more difficult relationships, not more complicated, also a bit funnier. Like life is both harder and funnier than it should be, I guess is one way to say it. Like it's, it's a, um, and you know, and also the ways that people I think have come in an increasingly unpredictable world and an increasingly um, maybe divisive or, or con conflict filled world, the ways people have come up with uh, trying to help their children navigate that as well. And, and I think that was, um, you know, really came through, uh, you know, the, the Spider-Man costume served the dual purpose, I guess, of not identifying the in-family kidnapper and also um, <laughs> letting the kid feel a little safer. Uh, also that's, you know, that's something that, um, I have thought about before is, you know, I know this thing about um, whatever the percentage is, I can't remember, but some shock, like some incredibly vast majority of kidnappings of children are done by someone within their family. And it often has to do with like a custody dispute. Um, but at the same time, all of the um, portrayals of that in media are 
it's never that it's always some like you know snaggletoothed um crazed person who who takes children <laughs> um and i think just just getting a look at maybe some of the realities of of the feelings that would be involved in that situation why someone might be pushed to such extremes is a really interesting angle so uh i like many people here i think would look forward to to reading the rest of that when it's finished so thank you very much for coming and sharing appreciate it if you want to respond i can unmute you there you go <laughs> okay yeah yeah, Ooh, yeah. There's, there's an issue where we have the 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 echoing but yeah thank you so yeah that's i i I, I literally have not thought of what I just wrote in that way. It was actually very helpful for me to hear. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I think when it comes to writing fiction now, it's, 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 I, I mean, I teach at, at FSU and a lot of my students are undergrads and um, there's not usually a, let's say a pathos or even a logos driven argument for why you should write characters that you don't necessarily like right away or characters that you don't immediately find a easily accessible means of empathy. Um, it can be a, it's, it's tough to do that with fiction because you're, you're, you're sort of asking yourself to look into the lives and the, like the souls for lack of a better word of, of people that are very much unlike yourself. And I, I think the worst thing that fiction can do right now is to insulate and to, to silo off again from what's going outside like your own house walls, your own like living quarters, your own city. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's it, it's a weird world to be writing fiction where um, there's there's there is satire, but it's the it, the the line is the line is a mess. I mean, yeah, you know, there's there's all sorts of systems of control that we don't really have control over anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a funny funny time to be writing the like the imagined kind of realism that is that you typically see in a lot of like 20th century literature where it's gritty and sort of like nose to the grindstone it's a lot of it's happening online in ways we don't really understand um but thank you sure. thank you again for having me oh sure thank you and and yeah just on that like the thing that popped into my head instantly would be it'd be hard to write like a noir detective story where the guy goes in to talk to someone in a bar and can't get their attention because they're on their phone for five minutes you know, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't quite work it'd be a little uh a little challenging so anyway. sorry and, and at the same time it's that's the way the world is it's just mm -hmm. i mean uh I, I won't take up too much time but it's watching sitcoms from the 90s it's it, mm -hmm. it, it it's it that's the science fiction that <laughs> to, mm. to our era now i mean like the world like before big data Mm -hmm. thank you yeah no thank you it's definitely a fascinating world we live in and again uh like i said at the top you know one of the reasons that i like doing this is this is a very easy way for me selfishly you know myself trina noli uh, a few people who've been here very often but uh when we get to come here every week and, and see everybody's work and it lets us get into people's minds a little bit uh generally speaking i'd say people we would kind of agree with about most things but Still, people are coming from different parts of the world, different backgrounds. It's interesting. Anyways, our next, um, I'm going to say presenter, is uh, in a first for us. We've had two other visual artists um, previously in the show's uh, eight-month or so run. This is our first photographer. Uh, Evel Clovis is a Haitian-American photographer. A lover of fine art, photojournalism, and lifestyle portraits, his photographs represent people of color who share common experiences in dealing with race, hair, religion, and perception. His work has been featured at FAMU Foster Tanner Gallery and Mohawk Gallery. He currently lives in Cincinnati, Ohio, with his wife and his newborn son. So, Evel, you should be able to unmute, and you should also be able to screen share. Yes. Do you, do you see my screen? I don't have anything yet. Um, let's see. Mm. Let me just make sure I haven't. I may have to make you full host for this. Let me try that. Try that now, see if that works. 
This is right back to, to Robert's point about how much of life happens on the internet now. <laughs> there we go. How about now? Anybody? No, I'm not getting it either. Hmm. <laughs> We have any Zoom experts in the house? Uh, I'm going to suggest maybe we want to just switch the order up. And um, Ivel, maybe if you want to send me or Ridge the PowerPoint, um, email sure. it. Email it, and then um, and then we'll queue you up for next. Does that sound okay. good? Okay. That's fine. Back yep so now i just need you to give ridge back his hosting baton yeah he's <laughs> we're very professional thank you <laughs> sorry about that i'm doing this for my ipad so it's definitely a little more Complicated. All right. There we go. I got it. Thank you. I'm, I apologize for that, everybody. So yeah, Evel, um, if you want to send it over, uh, Trina, yep. do you want to send him your email and? Yeah, I have her email. I have her email. I'll send it on. Perfect. All right. So in that case, apologies for the shuffle, everybody. But up next, uh, we have ourselves. Uh, a real, I would say, a, a power couple. Um, now, let me find the correct bio to read. Oh my gosh. You know, uh, it's one of these things where when it rains, it, it pours. Um, so I'm actually just going to read the uh, bios as they are. So we have a couple, uh, Madalasa and Juan Pablo Mobili. Uh, I will read um, Madalasa's bio, Juan's bio, and then a little note about what they've done uh, together, and um, we'll be off and running. So Madalasa Mobili was born in Detroit, Michigan, and began her writing career many years ago as she wandered the Hudson River paths, trying to find just the right words to express what she was seeing. Two chapbooks from her Meditations by the River are eventually forthcoming, Wild Silence and Billy Hopkins, poems where deep observation always looms larger than having to speak at length. Madalasa is a lifelong meditator and singer of Sanskrit chants, a Hatha yoga instructor for disabled people in the community where she lives, and a lecturer on the teaching of the feminine principle. In all these endeavors, Madalasa travels along a single thread, the appreciation of the divine in the apparently mundane. Her blog, Madalasa Mobili, Musings of a Suburban Housewife, is a continuation of her never-ending search for truth. Three Unknown Poets, which you will be reading with uh, her husband from tonight, is her first published book of poetry in collaboration with Juan Pablo Mobili, who was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, to a devoted school teacher mother and his poet father, a man who lived every word he wrote, even when they hurt. Juan has been a poet for as long as I can remember my father writing words in short numbers, one line below another that never traveled the length, the whole length of a page, oh, excuse me, of page width. He published one book of poems in his youth, mimeograph poetry, along with his friend Claudio Ferraris, one of the many victims of the state terrorism in Argentina during the 1970s. Juan is also a consultant to organizations around the world, focusing on the need for authentic leadership and power of purpose. In all he does, he praises curiosity above all, a river worth sailing my whole life. Lovely thought. Several of his poems have appeared or are forthcoming in First Literature Review East, Spirit Fire Review, Mason Street Review, The Red Wheelbarrow Review, The Journal of American Poetry, and The Worcester Review. He co-wrote a chapbook of poems in collaboration with his wife, three unknown poets. Madalasa and Juan have been together for 37 years, and for most of them, they've lived near the Hudson River in the state of New York. They have raised three sons, now men, and are the grandparents of Sophia and Scarlet Rose, the most beautiful poems in their lives. 
Nice. All right. So one. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thanks. First of all, thanks all of you for being here. Uh, people that gather on a Friday night to listen to poems and prose are noble souls, particularly in these days where we're still wondering or at least wanting to confirm who the leaders of this country will be. So the future, hopefully, uh, will read slow enough that we'll know the results of the elections by the end of this, this series, okay? So, um, Madalas and I, we've been married for 37 years. I'm not counting the years in sin. These are the, le the legal years. And uh, at some point, I would say, in around 2011, 2012, we were sitting in our porch together one summer and she said something and I was in my laptop being interested in something else. So I said something like, you should write a poem about this. And she captured my this and she said, no, you should write. So I wrote the line and I emailed it to her and she emailed it back. You gotta get the picture. We are sitting with our laptops facing each other in a small table. And that was the beginning of these poems. So these poems are thoroughly written together, one line each. And then of course we edited just to honor whatever poems, some maybe more or less one person's lines or the other. Uh, but basically I thought of it as just a wonderful exercise and doing something together. Madalasa will have, as always, a deeper reading of what, what's going on. If I wanna know what's going on in my life, I ask her. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Madalasa to tell you what she wants to tell you about um, the genesis of these three unknown poets. What I could tell you is this, we wrote almost like 50 poems, we published 12. And at some point we realized that some of the poems belong together lyrically, they were like clusters. So I decided to give names to the cluster. So we invented three poets. These are the three unknown poets. They don't exist. Pepe Pican, a man from the Mediterranean Sea, a Spanish man. Harriet Morganwood, that Madalasa says, teaches in Sarah Lawrence, creative writing. And then Salma Basri, which is supposed to be an Arab poet, a woman who lives somewhere in Saudi Arabia, and that was inspired by my, my work in the Middle East. So that's kind of, just so you know, the three poets is the two of us under three different names. We'll read two poems of each. So Madalasa will talk about her, her take on how this came about and then read the first poem. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for coming. Um, Juan gave you like the broad structure of how this came about. And not surprising to most people who've been married for any period of time, my perspective of how this all began is wildly different from Juan's. And um, um, so I'll just share a little bit about it. Uh, we have been married, as he said, for 37 years. And for up until last March, when the pandemic struck, um, Juan has been on the road for a minimum of 150 days a year. So we raised three children together. We have two grandchildren. And, you know, Juan was a, in many ways, and, you know, it's, it's like the traveling salesman. You know, he'd come home and unpack his bag and wash his shirt and pack his bag again and leave. And so this, has gone, this had gone on for several decades of our lives together. And um, at some point I was feeling, I don't know, disconnected from him, disconnected from life, disconnected from my own particular purpose and, 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 and focus. And I was a little bit cranky, you know, to be honest with you. And we were sitting at the table as Juan said, and he's face in his computer and my face in my computer. And I realized that if we were gonna go on like this any longer, we may need to uh, take a, a, a fresh look at things. And so at some point we just came up with this idea why don't we write a poem together? 
So he sent me a first line. I sent him back another line and he was gone or he was home, but we would only communicate in this way uh, through the poems. And the only rules about this game was that um, you had to take the line the way it came. And um, my darling Juan, who is a wonderful writer, as you all know, oftentimes would receive my line with all kinds of, you know, like, what the fuck is this? I mean, you know, this is, what am I supposed to do with this? And I say, well, I don't know, figure it out. And so we went back and forth. And like he said, we've got, you know, 20, 30, 40 poems over a course of, this began in 2012. So it's been a, many years. And um, what was fun about the project was that uh, once, you know, we'd go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for as long as it took. But for some magic, I can't even tell you why, we, knew both intuitively that the poem was done, that we had said what we wanted to say. And um, then we got to have some fun with this. We got to then edit and slash and cut and this and that and the other thing. And then the poem would just tell us when it was finished. And, and um, like Juan said, we have these three children that emerged, not only our three sons, but these three poets, um, Pepe Pecan from Spain, Harriet Morganwood, our lovely creative writing teacher from the East Coast, and Salma Basri from the Middle East. And um, so I'm gonna start with Pepe. He was our, what we call our firstborn. And this poem is entitled, The Spider. The spider who lives on the front porch refuses to be swept away, but she doesn't come and tell us. She weaves instead when we are not there. It is useless, however much we sabotage, she is committed to repair to set up shop, to get on to the business of protecting her house. She's asking to coexist. Her whole world fits into whatever we don't notice. Um, you need to unmute one. Thank you. Okay, this is the second one by Pepe Pican, and then I will read the first one by Harriet Morganwood. So Pepe Pican, the first time I saw James Dean. I still remember the first time I saw James Dean on the big screen. Once he rode into the frame, even Natalie would disappear. It was a rebel without a cause in the church basement one Sunday afternoon. A lonely seer, an angel in all its contradictions, a rider along an infinite highway. He looked at women and they melted. He looked at men and they felt the bleakness of their lives. Back then, I did not catch the desolation in his eyes, that horse of death on his pupil. I wonder what it's like to be defined by others to be so full of talent and tragedy, so young, so suddenly finished, riding to his death on a motorcycle or a horse, defying life itself in the basement of a church. So that's Pepe. 
Thank you. And now we're gonna we're gonna move to Miss Morgan Wood, Harriet Morgan Wood. So this poem is called Predators. Most of the photographs are predators. She takes photographs of birds at night in her room and she writes notes in the margins of small novels. In all these years, she has never flown, preferring to nest in her studio. She admires the talents of an eagle, their decisiveness, so quiet on the edge of the cliff. The photographs are only in black and white, taken at dawn, bright swooping in on the dark. And now Madalasa will read the next poem by Harriet. The next poem is written in dedication to our niece who we adore, Carla, who lives in Buenos Aires. And it's called Sparrow Girl. She looks like a doll made of toothpicks. Her hair is a nest where she sits and watches the city. Her eyes stained with the coal of a number two pencil, black circles born out of caves of grief, fire pits and ice and snow. She's so fragile, you'd be afraid your angry words might break her. Dead doves and acrobats on ledges are telling us something. As Sparrow Girl plummets down toward the brightly lit avenue, as the gatherers gasp like Aztec children at a ritual, as vanilla in plastic jugs by the acrobats themselves. In the morning, she picks herself up from the pavement. She puts on her flat rubber shoes and heads out to work. I often think you'd imagine someone stronger would be in charge of joy. Not someone who could turn her shoulders into the armrests of tiny chairs. Yet Sparrow Girl makes every arrangement. She books every event, picks up every tab, even as she hones her humor eye like daggers. Her silence, the sharp edge served on small white plates. A doll made of toothpicks being good for the whole thing, starving after another day of umbrellas and machines. You have to unmute, unmute one now. So these are the last, the last two poems. Uh, they are by our third imaginary poet called Salma Basri. She's uh, in, our, in our imagination, a stark, noble, important woman in the Middle East in terms of soulness. soulness. Anyway, so two poems, and we wanna finish with the one Madalasa reads. This one is called, I wonder if Allah was away when I left my message. He may have missed me, passed the potter's wheel across the mosque, just a ways beyond the pond. The potter is a Christian and we both are made of clay. Neither one of us looks each other in the eye. Men who cannot look a woman in the eye leave behind a stink. I wonder if my message got erased. Does he have any 
idea how wounded I am to be a woman in this world. All the dresses, those abayas, all the books and blankets, our patients stop rocks. The answering machine is old and full of pleading and lamenting. The potter's pots are hard and indifferent, like the stink of a man when he's not looking at you. <laughs> and now to Maralasa for our final uh, sound. This is called, I don't remember what I said, but it dove into the water. I don't remember what I said, but it dove into the water without ever considering how shallow it could be. I wrote a letter to a young man this morning. The day is hot and dense and shows no signs of breaking into song. A letter only an old woman could write. Be kind, tell the truth, don't steal. We say things as well intended as white doves. We hope the laurel in their beaks wish everyone well. And we also listen as the eagle's talons ready for the kill. Be kind, tell the truth, don't steal. The sky is feather white and red with bloody dialogues. I wrote a letter to a young man this morning. I asked about his mother. Is she well? Are you kind to her? I hope he still carries a leaf of fresh laurel when he visits her. All right, wow, thank you guys so much, uh, both of you, uh, really. I remember, so uh, Juan was one of the early guests on the podcast um, <clears throat> that I have done related to this reading series. And I remember him telling me about this and I think we had to cut out the part where we discussed it just for, for time reasons. Um, I have a personal belief that podcasts should never be more than a half hour. Um, but I remember thinking about this and, and hearing about it and thinking um, what a remarkable thing it is to do to, to you know, co-create in this, um, I mean, obviously you guys have made a home together, you've made a life together, you've made children together, all, you know, raised children together, all this stuff. Uh, but there's something very uh, vulnerable and self-bearing about, about doing this together. And I can only imagine the editing process because I can, I, that's like a minefield, right? You gotta, you gotta, <laughs> gotta watch out for people's egos and, and uh, attachments to certain things. So uh, I think that's, that's absolutely wonderful. And, and I know, um, you know, the, the idea of um, inventing and writing in character is, is also incredibly interesting to me, but the idea that it was less that the two of you decided and more that the two of you discovered these characters uh, by doing the work is in itself like a, a a beautiful and startling thing. So I think everybody um, should definitely go out and uh, uh, believe we have we have a um, an address to which people can mail to, to get the chat book. I uh, think um, Noli just posted it there or you can I'm sure just ask Juan on on Twitter and uh, and and find a way but everyone you know who feels the need should definitely go out and get it. Um, we got our copy mercifully from Juan. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, it's really, I, I gotta say, like of all the things that, um, we've had on the show that have changed my thinking about how you could do things. I think that is one where I've always seen creative, create, I just said that weird creative pursuits as something that I like retreat into by myself. Um, I, I, you know, eventually when it's done, then it connects me to other people, but you know, in, by connecting in the actual creation of something. I think that's really uh, 
remarkable and um, brave, uh, for lack of a better term, too. And, you know, I'm happy that uh, everything, you know, that you guys are still in the same house and still married. That's very good. <laughs> it's very important. So uh, I think if the writing definitely uh, helped. And also just, yeah, on a personal note, Trina just said in the chat there, but Juan is the, as we said, the first three-timer here on the show and also has sent us so many wonderful people um, to to participate in our you know, community. So we, we really do appreciate that. And, and it would be hard to let that go without saying. So thank you. All right. Uh, so now we should be all set for Evel. Un you can unmute. And then Trina, you have the, the necessary. You can, un you can unmute as well. There we go. All right. So I will mute myself and uh, you guys can go for it. Okay, <clears throat> good evening. First, thank you to Trina for reaching out to me and inviting me to participate. And thank you to Ridge uh, for also doing such a wonderful job hosting, um, despite the technical issues and difficulties earlier. And I'd also like to give a big thank you to Yeli, who forced me to get out of my comfort zone. So I, I do appreciate all of you. And I do appreciate Diane and Robert and the previous couple too for their wonderful poems, Juan and Nadalsa. So thank you for those readings. So as some of you may know, my wife and I just had a baby who was scheduled to be born tomorrow, but he decided to be born just a few weeks early. His name is Elson Martin Clovis. So we're just new parents trying to adjust to lack of sleep and to the lack of election results. So I'm looking at you, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Georgia, and Arizona. Now, I ha well, what I'll be doing today is just presenting a few photographs from my time in Haiti, along with a poem at the end that my wife wrote, Sakina, um, to accompany just a few, two of those, three of those photographs. Now, Haiti, as you know, is a third world country, and being a Haitian American, I just feel very fortunate to grow up in America, but also i um, grateful that I did grow up in America and not in the rough state where my parents grew up. So this first photo that we're looking at is the house my father, his sister, and his mother actually grew up in. And every time I look at it, I just see it as I was, me and my sister were just born one flight away from living in that type of poverty. So this photo means a lot to me. Um, I think about it a lot. And it's just a reminder for me for the poverty. And so, and this, this is the village my father grew up in. So if you go on to the next photo. <clears throat> this is how devastating it actually is. This was a woman who was just selling. Um, she was on her way to a market that was down the street just to sell chopped up wood at a market. So it's not really much you can do with that, but it's, she went in, you know, in a yard, chopped up some wood and trying to sell it to passerby. And you can go on to the next photo. And so this, these next three portraits are portraits of children I took um, when we went on vacation. And I hate to see you say it that way, but when we went on a vacation and we were out on a sand dollar and these children came up to us just trying to sell us anything they could. But so instead of being in school, there were these children just um, doing what they can to try and help and support their family. And so when I look into their eyes, I see this, I'm reminded like, you know, this possibly or potentially could have been me. So what I did, you know, we gave them some money and got to talk to them and, um, you know, try and get to know them. But it's very heartfelt when I look at these photos. So we have this photo. The next one was the this photo of this young girl too. So they swam up to our boat just like that. So it was hard enough just even taking these photos um, when I was doing it. 
but you know it's just about getting past that mindset and you know i wanted to do this just to <clears throat> bring awareness to what's going on yeah the next photo and despite that they were actually like you know happy that i was doing this for them but it tore my heart just even doing it and it's a privilege that i think we all take for granted Okay, and so next photo. And so just to come back home, the potential home where I could have been. And now I do wanna give um, just an explanation before I go on, go on to the next set of photographs is that first I wanna let you know what the arrest of ek means. The arrest of ek is essentially a, an indentured, an indentured um, person who works for a household. So my grandparents who were living in Haiti, uh, my, my parents were able to, you know, do what they can, gave, gave me and my sisters a successful life in America and were able to buy, um, buy a home and have it built from scratch in Haiti. Now with that said, they had my grandparent, my grandfather at the time and grandmother had something called a Resavec. And that's someone who like lives with you. And for my grandfather, he had two, what the parents did at, at an early age, they sold them off because they, they couldn't afford to give them or provide an education. They sell the children off and they do your chores. <clears throat> Almost, it's not, it's not, it's, yes, an indentured slave. Is, so that's the ugly part of it, of all of this. So they, um, instead of, instead of um, going, being, <clears throat> instead of not being able to go to school, they kind of sell them in a way where my grandfather will raise them but to, to allow them to go to school but what in return they have to cook and provide and help around so now on to the next photo this was just a little goat um <clears throat> when we went to my my grandfather's house at the time my wife and i we were just sleeping and we just heard this thing crying all night and it's an exp before I get into the poem, it's something that it sounds like a baby crying. And now that I have my newborn son, the, the cry is just like that. And so for before we get into this, I do want to say this is not safe for work, even though work is over, not safe for life. If 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 this throws you off. Next photo, please. And I will get into the poem for called Tasso from the Neg, Haiti, written by my wife, Sakina Hoffler. And before I do that, we can go on to the next photo. A baby-faced Resabek gripped a machete, the length of my arm, in a single neat stroke, severed the head of a goat. Two other Resabeks strung the carcass by its hind legs, while the youngest drained blood from its neck into a silver bowl. Their blades paired fur that peeled as easily as my husband and I pulled back our sheets. Last night where we laid, kept awake by the crying of what we thought to be a colicky baby. It was actually this animal, wang and bang, aware of its fate. To be stripped, sliced, separated from its heart and its lungs, its insides doused with water. Later, when the rest of X serve us, served us brown pieces of goat resting on its bed of rice, I did not think of those expired eyes, but rather of how I live in New Jersey, where I purchase meat, neatly shrouded in plastic, and not here as one of the workers, Resavex, who have to cleave, gut, maim, wipe brows, damp with sweat and clots, and fry meat. They will not be permitted to taste. Mm. And I end it with a picture of home. And that's it. Thank you for your time. And thank you for having me. Val, thank you so much. Uh, those are like, if you had to pick a certain, certain images to not, um, uh, to truly humanize, you know another place it's very easy for us to sort of uh 
I'm, as I'm sure you're aware, it's very easy, especially for, you know, um, well, for people who get, you know, bogged down in the details of life, but have predictable food, money, all that, you know, all this stuff, it's really easy to sort of forget about um, the human struggle in, in places where maybe people would be, would be going on a trip, vacation, things like that. The photos of the children's faces particularly were really affecting. I mean, just not, um, you know, not because they look miserable or starving or anything like that. They're just, they're just looking right at you. You know, it's, it's like, it's a connection that you kind of can't avoid um, in those images. And then, you know, with the, um, the goat, we had a, a, we actually had a really long discussion after the show, either last week or a couple of weeks ago about um, the difficulties of, uh, you know, reconciling uh, consumption of animals with animals themselves, like, and how that can be really tricky. Um, and I think, uh, you know, to, to pair it with Sakina's poem, obviously we, this is, by the way, this is like the power couple TGI this Friday, because we had Sakina on the show um, uh, a few months ago, I think, but but yeah, I would, to, to pair that with, you know, a poem about uh, not only the goat itself, the cries, and then also the, the, the gratitude for, you know, living in New Jersey, having these sort of these safety nets or not, not quite safety nets, but these givens in place, um, I think is really amazing. And, you know, just learning a little bit more about, um, I'm sure for yourself, uh, you know, going in depth and learning a bit more about not only, like you said, not only what your, you know, parents or grandparents' lives were like, but what your life could have been like if, if you hadn't, you know, relocated. Um, is this, uh, is this part of like a larger piece or is this sort of like, this is a set of photos that you thought were representative? It's, it's a set of photos that I thought was, uh, that I just represent, want to, want to represent mm -hmm. um, the importance of, and the awareness to bring to you know Haiti and well the for people the what we don't see as media what the media doesn't show like I'm able to go into the like deep into the villages. Sure, yeah, and and also I can imagine you know obviously there was a big piece of news about Haiti when there was an earthquake there maybe a decade ago, and people were talking all about it for maybe six or eight months, and then since mm -hmm. then it's kind of been like it, we you know. The rest of us move on to something else unfortunately um so i think it's also really important for people to remember that you know the problems are not solved the, the but also the people are not um how can i put this also the people are not one-dimensional victims they, they are people and and you know their their life is is complicated and worth respecting and you know the, there are elements of them that maybe are they need assistance with, but they also can sort of show us things about ourselves. So I think that's awesome. I, uh, I am not um, versed in photography. Uh, I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I will say the images were really, you know, the, the thing that got me the most was the woman with the, the sticks, uh, the way that the photo was ripped down one side. There was something about that um, that really, Ooh, I'm not going to be able to come up with a, uh, an articulation of it, but I really did something internally. So that that's, I think the best way I can say it, it made me feel a very specific feeling. So anyways, uh, thank you so thank much. You yeah. <clears throat> thank you for noticing. Thank you for noticing. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, I, I don't know. I'm, I look forward to seeing some more of your work and uh, oh. for now. Um, and also next time, if we have more photography, if you come back, if you have another set of photos, we will, Maybe we'll do a test run on a Thursday of the technology <laughs> stuff. <laughs> we'll make sure. I'll make sure not to use my iPad. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Um, all right. I will wrap things up here. Uh, as always, um, if you guys would like to hang around and chat or ask questions of the uh, presenters um, about their work or about where you might be able to support them, please do so. We will leave the room open um, for some time. Usually we end up just hanging out and chatting to a few of the regulars for um, a while anyways. Um, it looks like Sakina has the camera on. So if you also would like to see a, a brand new human being, uh, you can see, see him there. Um, anyways, uh, 
quickly, really quickly, if you want to uh, catch up with us, you can go over to tgicast.com that has upcoming events, uh, lists of previous events, uh, and a YouTube uh, or video archive, uh, embedded YouTube videos uh, of events. Um, we are also putting together a um, uh, list of everyone who's been on the show and their works so that we will have like a little TGI syllabus of things people can purchase to, um, to uh, support our friends here. Uh, that reminds me, this thing runs on friendship. If you know someone that you think might be a good fit for us, if you yourself uh, make something or write something, um, please, uh, you know, send an email over to our talent booker, uh, Noli Reed, um, and, or find her on Twitter at Noli Reed, uh, then she can help you get it all hooked up. Um, with that, I'm going to stop recording because I have spoken enough. Uh, I still need to come up with an, um, a sign off phrase. Normally I just say, and now I'm going to go to the bathroom, but I don't have to right now. So I, I don't know what exactly to say. And uh, I'm now completely chagrined that I didn't hit stop recording yet. And uh, that will live forever uh, to embarrass me. So um, hope I never run for political office. Anyways, uh, thank you all so much. I'm going to stop recording. And